Hello. Our story begins on a small vessel adrift in the Outer Rim. He was alone again. His criminal empire ousted him from control, and now he had nothing. There remained one thought on his mind. All he could think about was what it would taste like to finally have his revenge. Crimson Dawn betrayed him. He wanted them to pay. There were so many that needed to suffer for him to feel an ounce of completion. He sat in silence as his engines turned off, and his ship lifelessly drifted away through space. He looked down at his home planet of Dathomir. He would return to take what was rightfully his, but first, he needed to set his sights on his target. He walked towards the back of the ship and looked at a computer console set up in the bay area. He tapped on the device, and a couple holograms popped up. Despite being kicked out of his own criminal empire, he still had the resources. He knew Imperial fleet movements, and he knew how to smuggle himself to a place where he could achieve revenge. However, there was something that his master once spoke about. There was a Sith temple on Malachor, one with incredible power, and if he could access it, he could take down the Sith Lord himself. But Maul knew that to be a faulty idea. Everything Sidious did was misdirect him. Everything Palpatine said to him turned out to be a lie in some way, shape, or form. Maul couldn't be unwise enough to fall for it again. His initial desire for revenge on Palpatine came back to the front of his mind, and then he considered the others who deserved to be punished, Kenobi and Crimson Dawn. But not even he was at a position he needed to be at in order to destroy or kill either of them. Taking down Crimson Dawn would be difficult, however he could exploit his criminal empire. Kira had been gunning for Emperor Palpatine, so perhaps he could use the desire for assassination to get himself what he wanted. Maul sat back down and thought through everything. The last time he suffered is because he didn't think things through. Every time he acted in a rush and didn't ponder over the potential outcomes, he suffered. This time, he couldn't let anyone in. Or could he? Maul thought over everything from his past. Sidious was always three steps ahead, but this time was different. Palpatine was ruling over his empire. He was in full control of everything, so he wouldn't be able to foresee Maul returning from the dead to wipe him out. Though there was something he could do. If he wanted to gun for Mandalore, he could take over their world. Then he remembered that it wouldn't do him any good because Mandalore was under the protection of the Empire. Never mind that idea. He stole the Darksaber though, but his usage of it would have to wait. Kenobi could have been killed during the Purge, so there was little hope in finding him. And again, he wouldn't be able to get through the Outer Rim without having the struggle with Crimson Dawn. He had to give Kira some credit. She did a good job with what he built. Too good of a job. The day would come when he could exact his revenge against her. Maul then returned to his original plan, killing Sidious. That was an idea he had had ever since Mandalore, if not Naboo. To kill someone of such evil powers, he needed another individual to aid him. None of the Jedi in the galaxy were worth his time. Not even all of them in a combination would be useful in a confrontation against Sidious. He could gather up all 100 survivors of the Purge and throw them at Palpatine and he'd still come out on top. Maul then considered an idea. He could go to Coruscant and scheme. There were trillions of people on that planet. If he went there, he could hide himself. Perhaps, Maul considered an idea, one that he hadn't initially been fond of, but seemed to be his only option. He considered that Sidious' new pet would be a fine ally. After all, Maul was tricked into the same little predicament. Maybe Vader would be swayed from Palpatine's side. To Maul, this wasn't about setting up a new branch of the Sith. All this meant to him, was being freed from the shackles of his master's torture. Maul thought about Malachor once more. It couldn't be a trap, could it? No, it had to be. Ever since the beginning of the Rule of Two, the Sith required a master and an apprentice for everything. Maul didn't have an apprentice, and he wasn't loyal to the Sith cause anymore. He'd have better luck on Coruscant than Malachor. So he made his way to the surface of Dathomir and collected the Darksaber, and then left for Coruscant. When he arrived out of hyperspace, he saw the Imperial facilities that now littered the exterior of the planet. Coruscant was the most defended location in the galaxy, and Maul hadn't been back in years. He passed by the space stations and made his landing on the surface of the planet, finding a base for himself inside a level 104. It didn't take much, but Maul was able to find himself a little place to call home until he would be victorious. It was an actual apartment, and it would give him the free space to conduct rituals with the dark side. His main objective was finding Skywalker or Vader. Maul didn't care what his name was. He would be found, and then he'd be used for the creation of this new empire. Maul, after weeks of being in the lower levels of Coruscant, wouldn't find any luck connecting to Vader. He had, since his arrival, taken it upon himself to intercept communications between Imperials. This frequency was designed to intercept anything going through the space stations outside the planet. 
He was hoping that Vader would reveal himself, but nothing came. Maul spent months focusing on the dark side of the Force, waiting for Lord Vader's arrival. The day eventually came when Imperial deckhands inside the space stations communicated with each other. Maul was able to intercept the message and listen to the entire thing. Lord Vader would be arriving from the Mustafar system at specific coordinates. He was to have a fighter escort prepared and guide him down to the other specific coordinates. The Emperor had requested his apprentice's attention in person. No one inside the station knew about any of this. All they knew is Vader was going to the Imperial Palace and needed an escort. Sidious wanted to speak to his former pupil about his recent encounter with Kenobi, and how as leaders of the Empire, it wasn't their responsibility to hunt down relics of an era long dead. Maul didn't know or care about any of this. All he knew was Lord Vader's shuttle was coming from the Mustafar system. This was more than enough information for him, but his main focus was building a connection with Vader so that he could access him when he wasn't on Coruscant. Either way, it didn't matter. All he wanted to do was complete a connection so he wouldn't have to leave the planet. The issue for Maul was how close he could get to the Imperial Palace, one that once belonged to the Jedi. Maul was able to get close enough where he could sense Vader and Sidious' presence, however, this meant that they could sense him. By this point, Maul was talented enough with the Force where he could lock on the Vader's essence and just connect with it. He just needed to maintain the connection so that he could continue forward with the next step of the ritual. Despite the foundation of this ritual being founded in the ranks of the Sith, it was perfected by the Witches of Dathomir knowledge that Maul was able to utilize to further his Force bond with Vader. This was by no means a diet in the Force. It was a play on what Mother Talzin was able to do with Dooku during the Clone Wars. The only difference was, it was far less powerful, and its only motive was to access a connection through the Force, not torture. Mother Talzin knew a great many secrets of the Force, most of which she never passed on to Maul. He could only teach himself what little he found on Dathomir from Mother Talzin's journals. He continued the ritual and after hours of intensive work, to the Force, he connected. Luckily for him, Vader wasn't leaving Coruscant anytime soon. He was being kept on watch duty because Palpatine didn't like the idea of him running after ghosts. Vader, instead of being on planet, was situated inside of his personal destroyer. He was inside of a Bacta tank, still healing from his wounds on Mustafar. It would be here that Maul would inquire Vader's attention. To the Dark Lord, it was terrifying. He was in a restful meditation wishing for a different path. The life he dreamed of was gone, and the year or two after becoming Vader, he pushed all signs of Anakin Skywalker away. He was focused solely on revenge. When his eyes opened, he felt shivers roll down his spine. Maul stepped forward with an insidious grin and told him that after all these years, this is all he amounted to, a carcass of flesh floating around in a tube of Bacta. That was pathetic. Maul's metallic boots chimed off the ground, and then he stopped at the front of the tank. Vader tried to break free and Maul hushed him, telling him to come to Coruscant. They had much to discuss. Of course, unless he desired remaining the Emperor's pat, he could stay here and rot for all he cared. It obviously was doing him so well as it was, right? Vader raged and sent a burst of energy out, shattering the glass and sending back to across the room. When Vader looked up, he was suspended in the air like a captured animal, and Maul was nowhere to be seen. His suit was subsequently put back on, and he requested a shuttle, which took him directly to where Maul wanted him to go. Since Maul liked the little play on poetry, he brought Skywalker right to where his student was captured. The warehouse that Ahsoka and Barriss fought in was burned to the ground, but it was rebuilt in the years since the incident. When Vader arrived, his boots thundered across the ground and into the building. Maul had a hood over his head and was cloaked entirely from Vader, but he spoke from the rafters, asking this apparent chosen one if he remembered this blaze. Vader stood silently. All that was audible was his ghastly breathing. He demanded to know why Maul brought him here. The former Sith laughed and then suggested that he could have an alliance. The echoes of Maul's voice bounced around the building until Vader used the force to shatter the support pillars under Maul's feet, dropping him to the ground in front of him. Vader grabbed his lightsaber and ignited it, telling Maul that the time for words had expired. He stormed forward and Maul jumped to his feet, igniting his weapons and defending himself before spacing off. Maul told Vader that they could defeat Sidious together, they could rule the galaxy. Vader knew where he had heard the sentiment before. It came from the weak Anakin Skywalker and Mustafar, the incapable powerhouse of a Sith, the one who lost to Kenobi the first time. That Force-forsaken name, Kenobi. Vader raged, swinging at Maul, getting angrier with each swing he made. Maul stumbled backwards. He was starting to fear for his life. He was able to hold his own, but for how long that would last, he was unsure. Vader shoved Maul back through some crates and told Maul that he should have stayed dead the first three times. 
There'd be no saving him this time. No night sisters, no alliances, no brothers, no nothing. Maul stood to his feet, and their blades interlocked. Vader towered over Maul, and the Sith threw Maul backwards before lifting up with the Force in a choke, telling Maul to share his last words before being met with death. Maul told Vader as he choked in the air that Sidious was using him. He was offering an out. He had been betrayed by Sidious before. He was used to get to Dooku. Tyrannus was used to get the Skywalker. Vader would be used to get to the next one. They were just temporary fill-ins until they no longer served a greater purpose to Sidious. Vader shoved his hand outwards, pinning Maul against a wall, but no longer choking him. The Dark Lord stepped forward and raised his lightsaber, putting it across Maul's torso and telling him to choose his words wisely. Maul proposed that they destroy Sidious. He had too much power, and they could form an alliance, one without masters and apprentices, one without a grip over the other. Vader lowered Maul to the ground and deignited his lightsaber, looking down and asking what it was that he was suggesting. Maul told Vader that Sidious knew he was here. They could fight before his majesty and then turn on him. It would surprise Sidious. He wouldn't know what to expect. Vader looked away. It could theoretically work, but Vader needed more time. They needed to marinate Sidious. He was too brilliant to catch off guard. Maul agreed. They needed to take all the time they needed for this. Perhaps there was a safer location than the Imperial Palace to fight at. Vader grinned under the helmet telling Maul that he could tell Sidious that Yoda had returned from the dead, and they could ambush him there. This surprised Maul, but Vader knew that Sidious would never willingly allow Vader anywhere near the former Grand Master. It was one of the few opponents Sidious feared Vader going up against, aside from Kenobi. The plan was agreed to, and the two of them would spend the next several months constructing this master plan to trap Sidious and kill him. Maul was able to rally together a bundle of pirates, smugglers, and bounty hunters who owed him favors and prepare them for this essentially saying that they'd have a new emperor with the death of Palpatine. What surprised both Maul and Vader is they developed a genuine bond of camaraderie. It was no longer just killing Sidious, it was finally the two of them having a friend they could confide in. After nearly a year of making sure everything was perfect, they lured Palpatine into a trap. He showed up and was ambushed by Maul and a bundle of pirates. He didn't expect to find his former student still alive, but he was prepared. Sidious had been waiting for a moment like this for over a decade, a chance to finally kill Yoda and now he was betrayed by Vader. Vader wasn't with him when the battle started so he figured he would deal with this student afterwards. The only reason all the pirates weren't killed was because Maul was able to hold his own. That was his biggest advantage nowadays, he could hold his own against talented users of the blade. Maul was struggling though, it had been years since Sidious used a weapon, but he was still incredibly talented. The duel carried on throughout a forest, and as Sidious started feeling the sensation of victory, he ducked under a thrown lightsaber. He turned back to see Vader marching towards him. Sidious was furious. He threw his hands outwards in a massive burst of energy, throwing Maul from his feet and the bounty hunters too. He charged Vader and the Dark Lord defended himself. He threw his blade forward and used his power to push Sidious down, but blaster fire erupted. Sidious used this to his advantage to allow Vader to defend himself from both bounty hunters and the Saber. Maul joined the fight quickly after, and Sidious used all of his strength and mastery to beat them back. He cut through Maul's left leg before electrocuting a bundle of smugglers and then driving his blade forward towards Vader. He was nearly unstoppable, as Maul stood uneasily and carried on fighting. He was still struggling though. This looked to be a lost fight, and Sidious was enjoying every moment of it, the same way he had on Mandalore. Maul tried to join Vader, but as he got close, Sidious sent a wave of electricity at Vader. It covered his lightsaber, but due to the suit, Vader absorbed all of his energy. Palpatine specifically planned for this in case his foolish student decided to be ignorant. Vader fell to his knees and Sidious slashed downwards, cutting off his arm, just as Dooku had. Maul struck forward, trying to save his friend, before being caught up in a forced choke. Sidious turned towards Maul and told him that he doomed Vader to the same fate as his oversized Zabrak brother. Sidious slashed his blade down across Vader's chest and Maul cried out in a terrible no before Sidious released electricity from his fingers. He couldn't believe it. He failed again. Maul tried to resist but he couldn't. The bounty hunters were all dead or they fled from the fight and Maul was left alone. Sidious laughed and laughed before it was silence and the electricity stopped. Maul looked over and saw a red lightsaber sticking out of his chest and then he fell over. Vader was on his knees and Maul climbed over as quickly as he could and grabbed him. But Vader's weight pulled him over as Maul held him, telling him that they would get out of this, they would survive this, they had to, revenge was theirs, they won. Vader looked up at the sky, his vision fading in and out. The breathing from his respirator was broken and disfigured. Maul held Vader tighter, telling him to not let go. 
Bader turned to Maul and grabbed his hand with what he had left, thanking him for the most freedom he had felt since his first defeat. He then said to him to never let them destroy him. Maul didn't understand, but there was nothing more that could be said, as Vader's breathing stopped and his body slowly slumped over more. Maul gritted his teeth and yelled out a blood-curdling scream that echoed from each end of the forest. Days later, Maul would find himself at the Imperial Senate building. They were in a state of confusion. The Emperor had disappeared and Masameda was doing his work as Vizier of the Empire. When Maul showed up, he was met with confusion from Imperial shock troopers, but he had a message. It wasn't a new one either, but it was one he had saved from when he was a child, one he kept by his side throughout his entire life. It was something his master once said to him as a boy, something that Maul treasured and one of the few things that he kept with him after his loss on Naboo. Maul played the message in front of the galaxy. It was a recording of Palpatine, the way the people had come to see him, so they assumed it was recent. Palpatine called Maul his dear boy and told him that one day his legacy would be his to rule. One day, he would fall silent in a galaxy ruled by his own empire, and it would be that day that Maul would take the reins and become something more than he was now. Maul used this as evidence to prove that he was the heir to the throne, the true successor to Palpatine, and anyone who disagreed wasn't loyal to the former emperor. The truth is, Maul knew that Palpatine was manipulating him. His child mind at the time of the recording couldn't ever comprehend that Sidious was saying these uncanny things to exploit his power. Maul now knew. But the serious irony in all of it is the boy who was exploited became the man who was now the exploiter. The Senate couldn't deny what had been said, but there were many wishing that the Empire had no Emperor. Maul didn't care for their voices of burden. Masameda always moved his positioning to favor the highest bidder, and that was Maul, who would surely keep him alive if he supported him. To Mas, this was a deal. Maul was instantaneously thrusted into absolute power in the galaxy. Due to his ascension, he wasn't sure how to even grasp the length of his revenge, but there was an ally to his aid. Masameda knew that if he had favor with Maul, he could potentially usurp him from power, but for now, he had someone that he could trust. It was a way to survive, and a way to maintain power. Maz could walk Maul through everything he needed to know, everything his predecessor did and didn't do. Maz also wasn't stupid. He was well aware of Maul and he knew it was a lie. But why die when he could cement himself as a political powerhouse within the Senate? Maz's advice revolved around a number of ideas and decisions that would aid his own political control over the galaxy. However, the only issue could be the Imperial military. Maul found this intriguing. How could the Imperial machine turn against this leader? As it turns out, the machine had a long-standing relationship with Palpatine. For him to be thrown out and replaced by a no-name that no one knew about was eye-catching. If Vader and Palpatine were done away with, then what was to stop them from doing away with Maul? If Emperors were replaceable, then why not replace said Emperor with themselves? It was a kill-or-be-killed system, and it was designed to be that way. Moths now all had the same idea, which meant they could be considered rivals or enemies to Emperor Maul. Maul, even without the Force, could foresee that the Empire would cave in on itself. If it was structured to collapse without Palpatine, then he needed to make sure it didn't do that. Luckily, this all happened early enough into Palpatine's tenure that there were no plans for Operation Cinder. However, Operation Necromancer was still at work, despite being a bust. Palpatine may have essence transferred, but his clones and Exegol weren't prepared enough for him. He overpowered the clone, killing himself and sending out a burst of electricity that destroyed his labs, and sent a rupture through the planet's core, destroying it too. All of Palpatine's energy was sent inwards and combusted outwards, killing all of his Sith eternal loyalists. Maul was unaware of this, and the facilities elsewhere in the galaxy continued churning out work for their already dead former Emperor. The former Sith knew he needed to maintain control over this empire, and luckily, his first challenger would become his greatest ally. After a short contest with the Grand Inquisitor, Maul would earn his and the rest of the Inquisitorius' loyalty. They weren't Sith, but they were servants of the Sith. But because Maul was no longer a Sith, neither of them would serve what could be considered a dead religion. Initially, Maul wanted these Inquisitors to maintain the balance within the Imperial ranks. If a Moth, Grand Admiral, or other high-ranking Imperial officer decided they were going to make a push for power, make a public example out of them, execute them, do what needed to be done. Maul had no intention to hold back from the more gruesome sides of leadership as a dictator, but he still wanted a way to maintain control over the Senate without relying on Masameda. He could tell that, despite his friendliness, Masameda would have ulterior motives for helping him out. He then came up with an idea, one that could potentially save not just himself from a political soap opera, 
but also the Empire. He decided to return half the power he had to the Senate. In a way, he created a democratic autocracy. He couldn't be removed from office because he still maintained 51% of the power in the Senate, but this ensured he wouldn't have to watch over the political battlefield. They could make decisions to best fit the Empire while he focused on his personal interests. Maul still had an agenda of revenge filling his mind, body, and soul. He needed Kenobi dead, and he planned on eradicating Crimson Dawn. Maul also knew that Kira and Crimson Dawn would come for him. If he didn't do anything about it, then they could strike at the heart of the Empire. So in accordance to what he had seen take place in the Senate, he proposed a means to kill two issues with an inflated military. Due to the Imperial officers looking at him like chopped up meat, he decided to push them away from him. In a way to bolster support from the Senate and the public, he declared war on the Outer Rim. He knew that if there was a sense of patriotism, one created by him, then he would no longer be seen as a target. He also was aware that the Mon Mothmas and Bail Organas of the Senate would see him as an upgrade over Palpatine, so he could garner their support. In doing this simple action, he could rally both sides of the political spectrum to agree with him, while pushing the Imperial military quota established by Palpatine that was supported by the Senate. He also had his own hidden motives. The Empire would be able to dispose of Crimson Dawn and potentially find Kenobi, which meant he could have his great revenge fulfilled. Unlike Palpatine, Maul decided that his role as Emperor should be marked with public appearances. He was seen being adored by passing fans and supporters. He rallied the troops together on Star Destroyers, and then Maul realized he needed to have an identifiable ally to have by his side. Grand Inquisitor was usually with him, especially as the months went by, but he wanted something more. So, he used the Darksaber to go to Mandalore with a Star Destroyer and a fleet. When he arrived, elite Imperial troopers joined him as he descended down to the surface to confront the current leaders of Mandalore. It was up in the air ever since Satine's death. The clans were almost in a state of consistent warring, but he was here to earn their favorability. He wasn't seen with such favoritism, but he had the Darksaber, and then he killed Gar Saxon with it, after an intensive duel, one that was publicly shown on Mandalore. He then informed the people of Mandalore that they would join the Empire be seen as outcasts from the rest of it. Maul then would have Grand Inquisitor oversee the rest of the Imperial occupation, which drafted young Mandalorians into its military. A young Moff Gideon would try to get the Emperor's approval for status over Mandalore, but he was also denied. Maul didn't care for overachieving Imperials. They were not to be trusted. There was an ascending Chiss man who, while successful, was a bit too much of an overachiever in Maul's book. He didn't trust him, but Thrawn was very loyal to the cause and even the Emperor. Regardless of this, the main reason Maul went to Mandalore was so he could have his brand new royal guard. The original guard had to be done away with because they were all loyal to Palpatine. Plus, Maul liked the idea of having an entire new unit to himself, especially with newer designs, ones that screamed, loyal to Emperor Maul. His new unit of guards were Mandalorian trained, the few who were still loyal to him after the Siege of Mandalore. They were his personal guard, and their image became associated with Maul himself. The war in the Outer Rim was a gruesome one. The criminal warlords Crimson Dawn and just about everyone else dug their heels in and dared the Empire to come in after them. The Empire did, and they paid the price for it. Imperial officers were useless aside from Thrawn and maybe one or two others. Every space battle was a decisive victory for the Empire, because the criminals used CIS and Republic Tech from the Clone Wars, but ground battles were vastly different. Imperial army troopers were the first wave, and they struggled. It was guerrilla warfare. The Empire flew its colors over the Outer Rim and they marched to the beat of their trumpets, before they were bombed, shot at, and killed. Stormtroopers were the second wave, and they certainly were more effective, but they struggled too. The Imperial fleets refused to do orbital bombardments on civilian targets, due to a bill passed by the Senate after the war started which was actually approved by Maul. He did it because as Emperor, he wanted to keep his popularity up. People actually really liked him, so a lot of his darker attributes didn't show on the exterior. He still used the dark side, but the public was unaware of it. The bill he passed made sure Imperial officers couldn't just get away with easy wins by bombing everything. The Senate wanted the Outer Rim to be salvageable after the war. This is where Thrawn excelled, because he could maneuver his ground troops into decisive victories with relative ease. The guerrilla warfare was tough, but it was an art of understanding one's opponent. Captain Thrawn would be promoted publicly to Admiral and then again to Grand Admiral following his multiple victories. Maul initially hated him, but he came to respect him as the war went on. The thoughts and even feelings around a potential Imperial Civil War died with a focus on the Outer Rim. Troublesome officers were seen as useless and forgotten about or killed. The Empire craved another victory, 
but the Outer Rim, after decades and centuries of neglect, was ready to fight for their right to have their own sense of peace away from the Empire. Some senators became skittish with this, but Maul was determined, so much so that he went into the Outer Rim himself. He of course wasn't in any danger, but he, his elite guard, and the Grand Inquisitor became faces of the war effort. They would shoot propaganda videos in the war zones, but only already captured territory. Of course, there could be violence lurking around any corner, but for the most part they were safe from insurgents. Maul's elite guard consisted of Praetorians from Mandalore, as well as a squad of death troopers, all of which sporting different weapons. So they had a couple assault troopers, a heavy trooper, two snipers, a medic, and a squad leader. It was the perfect unit to show the elitism of the Empire. What aided each of these prop up videos was Maul's hypnotic voice. He already won the hearts of the people, but during these videos he would speak to the audience. He would tell them what he was feeling, things he was seeing, and giving citizens more of a reason to support his effort in the Outer Rim. During the war, an Inquisitor located Kenobi on Tatooine, and Maul abandoned the front lines and brought all the Inquisitors to the location to fight him. At this point, Maul had no reason to believe Obi-Wan would actually put up a fight, but he wanted Kenobi to bask in the failures of his order. Obi-Wan would have to fight the former Jedi, which were Inquisitors, and if he wanted to live, he'd have to kill them, like he should have his former pupil twice. The fight started off with a blast. Obi-Wan was quick and aggressive. Maul hadn't seen this energy from Obi-Wan since he first returned during the Clone Wars. Kenobi fought like a man possessed. The Jedi were dead and he was fighting for his life. Maul sensed something more but he couldn't figure out what it was, because right before he cracked the code to why Obi-Wan would choose Tatooine, he was thrown into the fight himself. Kenobi's duel with the Inquisitors would be nearly triumphant. He would have no issue dispatching a number of former Jedi. He didn't kill them, but he was defending Luke. When Obi-Wan tried to kill Maul, he only put himself into a greater disadvantage, because Maul wasn't fighting. He was watching. The combined strength of Grand Inquisitor and Maul was more than enough to defeat and kill an already exhausted Obi-Wan Kenobi. Maul almost pitied him. He died like a rat in the desert. Maul then requested that Grand Inquisitor scour the galaxy for Force-sensitive children and adults. They'd be used to restart the Inquisitor program because Maul killed all the survivors. Grand Inquisitor did as his Emperor requested of him, and Maul returned to the front lines, never learning of Luke Skywalker. Despite the Empire technically being what it was supposed to be, the war was still raging. Imperial forces freed slaves and quickly dispatched insurgents. Maul also made a point to lessen his grip on the regular citizens of the galaxy. He recognized the unnatural grip of tyranny, and due to running an autocratic democracy, he understood that the true power was perceived control. He didn't need people to fear him, he needed them to believe they had some sort of influence on the Empire itself, which worked much better than what Palpatine originally had set up. As Maul was in the Outer Rim, there was an assassination attempt on his life, one that was caught on live broadcast. He was doing his infamous prop up videos, these of which incurring trillions of live viewers per video, and his unit was bombed. The camera people went into hiding as death troopers quickly fired back at the insurgents. Maul was quick to defend himself and his men. To the citizens watching, they saw him like a superhero. They knew he wasn't a Jedi, but his use of a Jedi weapon was alluring. Maul stood over the injured Praetorian guards and defended them as the medic tended to the living members. The death troopers were down to half their squad members and Maul caught sight of the one responsible for this. She was the one who had been hunting him down for the entire duration of this war. Kira and Maul made eye contact as she escaped into the smoke emanating around the battlefield. The insurgents left behind were killed, and Maul made sure he did it on screen. The war had gone on for 9 months, and the people were yearning for a victory. After Maul's failed assassination attempt, the people called for him to be removed from the battlefront, but he played the role of a martyr, using every technique his master once used on him, and he bolstered more support for the war. There was a rallying cry. Shock troopers from the Deep Core worlds were dispatched in order to help their Emperor win this war. During the nine months of the war, there were added fighters to this rebellion. Individuals like Saw Gerrera, Infus Nast, and other fighting Jedi took it upon themselves to fight the Empire during this war. What they weren't prepared for was the full backing Maul received. He wasn't just popular, he became more popular than Palpatine, which was saying a lot. After Palpatine's death, they wanted statues of him and within the span of less than three years, Maul was able to turn their hearts around and breed an entirely loyal empire. Anyhow, Maul knew who his target was. 
Kira was trying to assassinate the Emperor for the longest time, and once Maul took Palpatine's place, he immediately became target number one. Maul would then join up with Grand Admiral Thrawn as it pursued Kira and the rest of the elite forces from Crimson Dawn. Thrawn would oversee their hunting, and then he would deploy his units into the battle arena. He requested that his Emperor hang back. But Maul, eager to continue boosting his popularity, demanded that he accompany his troops. So Thrawn put the Emperor with his best sharpshooter in the division, Migs Mayfield. Thanks to Thrawn, Migs was leading a detachment of Imperial sharpshooters on the ground, which Thrawn had been deploying throughout the war, due to their ridiculous effectiveness during sieges and battles. Migs and Maul would be a part of the prop-up videos as they watched the real final siege of the Outer Rim begin. The battle itself started with Thrawn's fleet decimating a criminal fleet of Venators and CIS frigates. After that, he deployed Imperial gunships to the surface of the planet, followed up by shock troopers and regular stormtroopers to support them. A battle began immediately as the insurgents led by the final members of this Outer Rim Alliance attacked. Infus Nest, Saw Guerrera, and Crimson Dawn made their move simultaneously. Thrawn prepared for this, and he used his men as cannon fodder. He prepared an air raid using TIE fighters to soften up the resistance before dropping ATDPs, supported by the larger AT-ATs. The walkers were a dominating force, and just to add to it, he dispatched TX-225 occupier tanks to the far flank. They were relatively undefended, but it worked in his favor. This is where Miggs' unit and Maul were deployed. They were able to seize higher ground and lay down supporting fire. Within the span of the first 20 minutes of the deployment, Megs Mayfield became a galactic household name. His sharpshooting skills enamored the audience of hundreds of trillions. The Empire was all in on this, and Migs had one hell of a personality too. As this was going on, Maul decided to break off from Migs. He was doing a fantastic job at what he was doing, but Maul wanted to finish this himself. The camera crew didn't notice he was gone, until a group of Praetorian guards followed their Emperor to the front lines. Shock troopers and stormtroopers were firing behind barricades and ramparts, as the walkers and tanks provided covering fire, and the camera crew watched the sharpshooters lay down suppressive fire, as Maul then darted out in front of his men. Thrawn wanted to scream in his command bridge, but he watched curiously. Maul's lightsaber ignited and he blocked blaster shots. His Praetorium guard was doing the same behind him. He continued forward and they followed closely behind, as the camera crews descended to get into the action. All they could see is stormtroopers rising up and following their leader in battle. Maul led the charge and his troops followed him. As they made their way deep into enemy territory, a shock went off, dispersing the Praetorians and Maul himself. The shock wasn't deadly, but it was surprising. Maul told his guard to finish off the insurgents. He would handle this. His lightsaber ignited once more and the Praetorian dispersed. Stormtroopers continued forward, moving around him as the camera crews caught up. Maul spun his lightsaber as the warrior told him he would die. From behind Maul, a light whip activated and he spun out of the way, before blocking a strike from Infus. Finally, his chance to enact revenge against Kira for her great betrayal. Behind him, as the battle waged on, the Imperial flag was raised and Maul continued fighting in the foreground. His lightsaber parried and defended from each strike made by his two opponents. People around the galaxy watched on the edge of their seats as their Emperor fought off two leaders of this resistance. Maul slid his blade forward only for Kira, someone he instructed, parried his moves. She was a product of Dryden Voss, which meant she would actually be a challenge for him. Maul dragged his blade across the ground and threw it forward, catching Kira in the eyes before he singled out Infus. She fought with everything she had, using her electric staff to defend every move he made, and then Maul caught her, destroying her staff before cutting her down. Maul knew he could use the Force, but decided against it. He needed to win this as a warrior, not as a Force user, not as a Sith, not as anything other than himself. Kira cleared her eyes and threw her light whip forward before igniting ancient blades. She swung them against him, one of the blades cutting Maul down the side of his face and the other locking onto his lightsaber. Maul stumbled back and felt his face before defending a strike made by Kira. He couldn't lose this now. He pushed back, throwing her off balance before driving his lightsaber forward at the same time she drove her weapon forward. It seemed as if they struck each other. Maul stepped back and revealed that she missed only by a few molecules. His robes were torn but he wasn't pierced by the blade. Maul stood over Kira as she fell to the ground and turned to the Empire watching from a galaxy away and told all of them that they had won. The Empire was stronger than ever before and they brought peace to the Outer Rim. He could feel his cut dripping and with the Praetorian Guard moving to surround him, he raised his lightsaber over his head and led out the battle cry for all of his troopers, four words that defined a legacy led by Maul, long live the Empire. As the Outer Rim fell into Imperial control, 
Maul returned the Coruscant as the hero of the war that the Empire won. He was seen as the individual to unite the galaxy, one that had been divided for over a millennia. The crime lords were gone, and the forces of corruption had been done away with. The future would have its challenges for him, but they would never come from the Jedi or the Skywalker lineage. Yoda would feel the changing colors, but would never receive a visit from Luke or Leia. The former Grand Master would remain in his solitude as the Jedi fell into extinction. Leia would follow in her father's footsteps and become an Imperial representative and then a senator for Alderaan. Luke would never meet his sister, and he would join the Imperial Academy under the name Luke Lars, as a request from his uncle. He would eventually drop out when he met a cunning young pilot and smuggler named Han Solo. Luke, Chewie, and Han would traverse the galaxy in their own great adventures without influence from the Force or the Jedi. Maul's reign as Emperor wouldn't be stopped by anyone. He'd be heralded in as the hero of the Empire. His work united what was almost a divided galaxy. There were talks of a potential rebellion and even a civil war when he joined, but they had no place in this new empire. Heroes from the war in the Outer Room would find a place in Imperial pop culture, Maul, Migs, Thrawn, and the Praetorian Guard all being included in this. There wouldn't be many more wars for Maul, but decades later, as a way to maintain Imperial pride, he promised by the end of the decade they would see the empire expanding into another galaxy. Tragically, Maul would naturally pass away before the end of that decade, but his words inspired a generation, a generation of which was able to move mountains and move into a new galaxy, one to continue Imperial expansion. Maul's successor would be Grand Inquisitor, and after him, it'd be through a line of other Inquisitors, ones that were approved by Maul and his successors after him. The Galactic Empire would be one of pride and strength, this strength coming from his leader, the leader the public considered the original Emperor. Maul made such a lasting effect, but none greater than the final words he shared on his deathbed. Long live the Empire. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to all of our patrons, Ben Rowells, Wells, Jacob Fett Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure, Mark Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tip, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was Yosemite, Anakin Shank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knock, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Johnny Daguin, Safe Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Gunless Ace. 66, Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Forza League Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Man 3 First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and the Deadwing Force support of the channel. Smash that like button. If you want to support me other ways, go check out Patreon, other cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. So, um, that was a wild ride. I really wanted Maul to have a lusting for revenge, but that revenge being very much so controlling of him. I wanted him to chase this revenge because that's like the only thing he is always after, and I wanted that revenge for him to be something of success. Maul is Sisyphus, that is his character arc defined by Lucas and Dave Filoni, and so I wanted that to be the antithesis of this Maul. That is not this character at all. But I wanted him to find success, I wanted his empire to feel like it would crumble in on itself without Palpatine, but him find a way to come out even better than what Palpatine was, and by doing that he would do it through a manufactured war. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the force be with you.